Hello everyone, I'm Brian Kessman, Head of Business Strategy here at Litho, and I'd like to thank you all for joining today's webinar, Agile's Trojan Horse, How In-House Brand Marketers and Creative Teams Are Adopting Agile. And here to talk about this topic today are our special guests from Agile Sherpas. We have Ross Libby, Head of Training and Delivery, and Colleen Dunn Hartunian, Agile Coach and Trainer. So they're both going to share with us why marketing and creative teams are in such a great seat to bring Agile into the enterprise organization. And they're gonna share some insightful data pulled from their just released fifth annual state of Agile marketing report. Uh, but before we get going, I wanna share why I'm so excited about this topic. First, if, if you're not familiar with Litho, our North Star as an organization is to help our customers achieve better content outcomes. And we do this by providing workflow and DAM software built around best practices for the needs of creative and brand teams. And with our workflow and DAM solutions, our customers can tame any feelings of chaos across the creative lifecycle and begin to develop better client relationships, better work and brand consistency. But you also need the right internal processes, processes that properly organize teams around your different types of work and that find the right balance of structure and agility. But that's, of course, easier said than done, which is, of course, why we have Ross and Colleen here to provide some guidance. Uh, but just one last note before I hand this over to them, and that's that they'd love to answer all of your questions, any questions that you have along the way. So at any point, please use the question box at the very bottom of your control panel. Submit your questions there. And at the end of our session, they'll go ahead and start to address those questions. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Ross and Colleen. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, so as Brian introduced, uh, my name is Ross Libby, um, and I head up training and delivery at uh, Agile Sherpas. And uh, what Agile Sherpas is, is we're a company uh, focused on helping evolve ways of working, um, some specifically Agile marketing um, for organizations that are on transformational journeys. Uh, over to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Colleen Dunn-Hartunian. Uh, like Brian mentioned, I am a trainer and coach for Agile Sherpas. Uh, so really, my roles are really working with clients to help train them, coach them, get them up to speed on Agile marketing. Um, so really excited to kind of dive into this today and share with you some of the results from the State of Agile Marketing Report and how that relates to you all. Uh, so without further ado, we'll get started here. So during today's session, just to frame up some takeaways that you'll get away. From this so we're going to be talking about this year's state of agile marketing report we're also going to be talking about some of the past reports and just how we have seen that data evolve over the last five years and the implications to set up non-it agile teams aka marketing what does that mean for our brand teams and creative teams um, we're going to dissect a couple different agile transformations ross later on is going to share some examples from real life clients that we've had and how they have applied their learnings to really bolster their transformations and to really um, help you all and see what you can take away from that to apply to your own organizations so we'll get right in ross do you mind advancing to the next slide please okay so the title of this is the Trojan horse of Agile marketing, right? So what does that mean? So if you all aren't familiar with the story of the Trojan horse, thousands of years ago, the Greeks and the Trojans, they were in a war with, with one another, went on for many years. People were very tired. They just wanted this thing to end. And so what happened was the Greeks ended up building this horse made out of wood. They filled it with their soldiers, and then they pretended to sail off into the night. So the Trojans thought, great news, this war is over. Let's take this horse that they built, let's bring it in. It's gonna be a sign of success for us. And then to their dismay, they realized that that horse was filled with Greek soldiers. So the Greek soldiers jumped out, they opened the gates for the rest of the Greek soldiers, and then they were able to invade Troy. So what can we kind of take from that? This Trojan horse in this particular situation requires the right timing and circumstances, right? If they had just tried this Trojan horse scenario in the beginning of the war, I doubt the Trojans would have bought it, right? It would have worked out much differently if they didn't have a game plan once the horse was inside Troy. So we'll talk about how we can apply these crucial lessons to uh, help with our efforts of spreading agile ways of working throughout an organization. <clears throat> 
Next slide, please, Ross. Okay. So we know the timing and circumstance is important, right? As in demonstrated by the by the Greeks here. And so why is the ground ready for Agile to be planted? So we have some of the results from the 20, uh, 22 State of Agile Marketing Report. When I reference this report, just to give you some background here, we've been doing this for about five years. Each year, it's a survey of over 500 marketers. This year, we had about 513 respondents. 90% of those respondents were from North America. The remaining 10%, they were made up from other parts of the world, but that'll just give you some context when we start to go through this data, or it may help answer any questions that you might have. Next one, please, Ross. So back in 2020, 84% of marketers said that agility was very important for them to get it through the craziness of 2020. As we know, uh, that pandemic still hasn't stopped yet, right? But you don't need a pandemic just to disrupt your business. Uncertainty is constant. That's the one thing that you can count on is uncertainty and change. Disruption in business, disruption in the market, the economy, the world. We see it, we see it time happen time and time again through here. So if we go to the next slide, we're going to be talking about some of the benefits of adopting Agile. And these were the top three that we saw out of the respondents from this re report. And one of the number one ones was speed to market and the ability to pivot away quickly. So if we know that we're disrupted or if something's happening in the world or we need to change directions, we need something, a tool that's going to allow us to be able to respond to that. A strong benefit for everyone in marketing as a whole is the ability to pivot in that speed to market. We also have a better prioritization of work that matters and actually adds value. So we are drowning out all that noise. We are focusing on that most important work, the stuff that's gonna have the biggest impact and move the needle the most, which is huge, especially when you have limited resources. I think every marketer, everybody who's been on a creative team, they know you're strapped. You have a limited amount of skill sets. You need to be really wise in how you use your people and your skills. And then finally, better alignment with organizations' objectives. So not only are we focusing on the work that is the most valuable and that matters the most, we're making sure that we're still aligned with what's important to the organization. It's just not the loudest person in the room who needs to get something done. We're really focused and funneling in to make sure that the work that we're doing has the most impact. Next slide, please, Ross. Okay, so if we know that the market is ripe for this, why aren't more people doing it now? Next one, please, Ross. You may need to hit it twice to populate the graph. Okay. So what we're seeing here is that nearly 50% of marketers are planning to implement Agile within the next six months. 43% planning on making that jump within the next year. So I want to point out that this is a 10% jump year over year from the last couple of years. So we're seeing this go up and up that marketers are wanting to adopt this way of Agile working. Next slide, please, Ross. So although we see the acceleration in this adoption, there can still be some friction, right? There are some things that can go wrong. A great idea is not the same as great execution. There's, there's a difference between there. And it doesn't always work as a Trojan horse because there can be some communication breakdowns. Maybe we're not as successful as applying these, concept, as these concepts because we're not a software team. How do we translate that into marketing? That's where we see a lot of people trip up. Marketers are not IT, and that's where things break down. Next slide, please, Ross. So we know that there's a definition problem and an understanding problem in what Agile is and how do we translate that into a marketing way of work. Uh, so we threw in this cartoon here from Tom Fishburne, also known as the Marketunist. Uh, and so they're in a board meeting here. We said, we didn't have a strategy. We kept changing our minds and failed repeatedly. So let's just tell management we were being, quote, Agile, right? So Agile has this connotation of just going every which way and it's okay to experiment and fail and not put out results. And that's the opposite of what we want. Next slide, please. So we have the data. We know the benefits. We know that's not a question anymore. Next slide. But the question is how we apply that to our marketing ways of working. We know that we should be doing this, but the question is really how we make that happen. Next, please, Ross. So what's our post-horse game plan, if you will? So we're going to use the lessons learned from Agile Marketing and the State of Agile Marketing Report to ensure we know what to do once we get our marketing agility horse inside of our walls. 
So let's go to lesson one in the next slide, Ross. Education has to be step one. It is key for those newer to Agile ways of working. We never want to assume that everyone understands what Agile is. Sometimes people may hear different buzzwords. Maybe they participate in a daily standup. Uh, maybe they have a retrospective or a post-mortem, right? So we all have this collective understanding um, that we've kind of piecemealed together of what Agile is, but do we have a unified idea and understanding as an organization, as a department, what Agile means and what that means for me on a day-to-day -day basis, what that means for Ross, what that means for your coworkers, what that means for everyone. Next slide. So we see this, we see this coming up time and time again in the State of Agile Marketing Report is that you see that the biggest barrier in preventing people from completely adopting Agile is an understanding and training in what that means, right? So people aren't sure what to expect or what that means for them. And when people don't have that understanding, they could feel threatened. You may see people resist. That's where that friction comes in. So we must create a tailored, deliberate, training moment for non-software teams for marketers here. And that doesn't necessarily mean they need to go through certification courses like a Scrum Master course or a PO course, right? It's uh, There's all these different marketing certification courses, workshops, training, blog articles that can help give people that understanding and the direction of what their role is gonna be and what's expected of them. So let's go to the next slide, Ross. So we know that a lack of understanding and training is a big barrier for a lot of marketers here. And so I want to introduce the concept of the 70-20-10 approach to learning. And so it's really talking about 10% structured learning. That's going to be training, right? 20% learning from others and 70% is on the job. So that's through doing, right? Experience is the best teacher. What can we learn from? What's working well? What's not working well? So that, that understanding and that training should look like a combination of all of these things. Next slide, please, Ross. We also know that Agile looks different outside of software and IT, right? We're not built exactly the same. Uh, people in a creative space work much differently than those in that sort of technology space. So let's jump to the next slide and look at it. <clears throat> So those who have originally heard of Agile, a lot of times they understand it from a software perspective, at least maybe in theory. They may hear the word Scrum, working in sprints, all these different things. But what we have found and what uh, the respondents have told us is that a hybrid model between Scrum and maybe some flow-based approach is the best recipe when it comes to Agile marketing. Because we're not software and IT, we have some more flexibility in how we work and maybe their structure isn't exactly uh, applicable to what we do. We see a hybrid, especially within creative teams, creative services, uh, where people need that flexibility. Maybe their backlog of work is built up of work from other teams and you need something that's gonna work for you. You need a tool that's gonna work for that. Next slide, please, Ross. So if we know the framework's gonna be different, what are the different practices, the different practices that marketers are gravitating towards? So we see the highest here, daily standup at 50%. So this is a quick check-in, 15 minutes. Uh, what did you work on yesterday? What are you working on today? What are some challenges that you have? So this is a quick and dirty plan for the day, short-term plan, so that people within my team understand what I'm working on. Maybe I need to hand it off to them. That's going to impact how they structure their day. So daily standups used correctly can be a really powerful tool in making sure that the teams are focused on the right work and that they're making progress toward that. We also see visual boards coming in at 47%. So this stat is a combination between whether it's a digital board or a physical board. And when I say board, this means uh, it's a receptacle to capture all the work that a team or a person is working on. So we can see that all in one place. So uh, by far, we see a lot of marketing teams using that, which makes sense, especially since we are mostly still remote, maybe we're hybrid, maybe we're back in the office, we have a blend of the two. So making sure that we're on top of having that all in one place is great and marketers are, are leveraging that. And also retrospectives. So let's talk about what's working well, what's not working so well, some ideas for the future, some appreciation that built in space for people to learn and to talk about 
the process and maybe what's a thorn in their side or some ideas for how to make things better. And we see a lot of new teams have retrospectives more frequently than maybe some more seasoned teams because there's a lot to learn, right? And we need to make sure that we're keeping a pulse on that and making change where we need to. The other ones, uh, not as high, but, but still uh, coming up there is sprint planning. So talking about that, that plan of what we're going to work on for a next period of time, having that prioritization conversation, what's that important work, what we're going to be working on, what should the team tackle to help drown out that noise of all these last minute fire drills that come in. We also see user stories or epics here, which help us translate the need from the customer, what the, the person that we're building the solution for, and the people building it. So it helps us with the why, so we can really pinpoint the solution and build the correct solution for the problem that we're trying to solve. And lastly, sprint reviews. There's a demo, show and tell, you may have heard different, different uh, words for this here, but that's when the teams really present the work that they've done since whether they're working in sprints the last couple of weeks, whatever it is, and they show it to their stakeholders, other people in the company, other people in the department, get feedback, share any preliminary findings, maybe some campaign results, and everyone can learn from that. All right, next slide, please, Ross. In lesson three, to sustain agility, changes run deeper than daily standups, right? It's the law of the instrument. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So if you are only doing daily standups, or if you're only putting things on a digital board that's only a piece of the puzzle, you must build in things that make this for the long haul. A transformation is much different than a change. You can add in a daily standup, you can add in a meeting, you can add in these agile roles for people to follow. But if you're not looking for ways to make this sustainable and to go deep into the roots of the culture of your company, you're not going to have that fundamental change. It must go deeper than a one-off training, than a one-off meeting every so often and be focused toward that fundamental change to really take hold. Next slide, please, Ross. And part of the way to do that, to make things uh, a, a fundamental change, it can look like structure, right? You can't necessarily shoehorn Agile into your current way of working. A lot of the times teams are not set up in an agile way in order to succeed. So here's an example of an organization design framework that we use at Agile Sherpas, it's called a remarketing. And what you can see here is there's all these different teams, the light blue, these are the different agile teams, the people that are actually executing and creating the work. This darker blue is a strategy group. So these are people that help translate the needs from the leadership team to the people making the solution. And then we also have a leadership team here. So they're helping us make sure that we're aligned to all these strategic goals and they all kind of hook in together to make this mechanism. So we must make time on the roadmap for these kinds of changes and put that time in, including the org structure to make this be a very long lasting change. Next slide, please, Ross. So we know that we need to, to make fundamental changes here that can look like structure, but also especially in marketing, could, we could be limited by how we budget right now. Um, traditionally, people have a planning at the beginning of the year, maybe it's a, a strategic planning for our marketing teams, but also that, that involves budget, right? What we have budget for is really what we're gonna execute. So what we have seen within the State of Agile Marketing Report is the changes into how people plan. We can't keep having these uh, creative teams create these huge robust plans and execute them just faster, right? A five pound bag can only hold five pound bag, five pounds of stuff. So what can we put in there that's going to be the most impactful and how can we find those frequent moments for revising that planning instead of that one large plan? So we see here that 27% uh, people review and revise plans quarterly. 29% review and revise plans quarterly or monthly based on business reviews. And then 14% use big room planning every six to eight weeks to update their plans and tactics. So we're gonna change uh, and do a pulse test on what campaigns we're gonna be doing based on what's performing well in the market, those metrics that we've received, um, things that we have shared in our sprint demo. Next slide, please. So we still have that annual strategy, right? That's the big dark blue that we see here, but there's a steel thread running through. So we have our annual strategy. How does that tie into our quarterly goals? 
How does that tie into our monthly projects? And then our daily tasks, what the teams are actually executing their day to day. Next slide, please, Ross. We also need to differentiate the how from the what. So I showed you that example of that org structure where you saw all the different cogs, the execution teams, the strategy teams, and the leadership teams. And so what's really different uh, with Agile is the leadership team where they tell the teams what the problem is they're trying to solve, not how to do it. We hire our people for a reason, they're subject matter experts. So we're really providing them with the freedom to build that solution that's gonna be best for our customer. Next slide, please, Ross. And here's where that ties in with budgeting. So we saw that people are planning differently, but because of that, they need to change their budgeting as well. So we see 64% of all of these have changed their budgeting due to agile planning in some way. So 6% from annual to semi-annual, 25% to quarterly, and 30% have some sort of dynamic and ongoing budgeting um, reevaluation that they're looking at. Next slide, please, Ross. And we don't want to burn down the horse. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong when we are entering this agile transformation. So here are some three things that can endanger the success of your agile Trojan horse and things that we can do to mess this up. So let's talk about some of them. Next slide, please, Ross. The part-time pilot, we see this time and time again. So everyone's busy, uh, especially marketers. We have a lot of people that we need to cater to, a lot of stakeholders. We have a lot of, we have a lot of pots on the stove here. So let's just try to figure out this whole Agile thing within our spare time. And Agile becomes one other thing to do and not a fundamental shift in the way that we manage people work. So maybe we'll say, I'm gonna put an Agile team together. They're gonna be on that Agile team 30% of the time. But what's wrong with that is we just add another thing on their plate of things to do. There's really no focus there. Uh, there's no change in how we design the campaigns or how we structure the teams. Nothing else changes. So you need at least 70% of a team's dedicated time to have a successful pilot. Otherwise, you just create this weird sort of microchasm of agile practices only, and we're not going into that mindset shift. And agile's power comes from that focus, where we're only doing the highest priority work only until it's finished. Anything else will not get you what you need. Next slide, please, Ross. The other one that we see is project agile teams, or um, since we can't do part-time agile or side of desk agile, we have 10 projects going at once. So why don't I just make an agile team for each one of those 10 projects? So what the issues are there is if I'm on 10 different projects and each one's a different agile team, that means I now have to go to 10 daily standups. I have to go to 10 sprint plannings. I have to go to 10 retrospectives and, and sprint reviews. And so that also is not a good use of my time. I'm not gonna be able to get any work done. I'm gonna spend all my time in meetings. And we're still not agile because we're not zeroing in on that focus. So again, you really need a team that's about 70% dedicated at least and to be mindful in how these different teams are structured. Next slide, please, Ross. <clears throat> and the good old swoop and poop. If you've never heard of this, I'm sure that you've experienced this. So this is when uh, leaders have the best intentions and they go to a team that's been working on a project. Maybe they're humming along or they have a lot, a lot that they're working on. And as a leader, I may swoop in and say, hey, I see that our competitor is doing X, Y, Z. This is really something y'all should be focusing on. So I want you to figure it out. I swoop out and leave my entire team frazzled. They don't know if I'm serious. They don't know if uh, this request is valid, if it has business value, right? And so doing this sort of swoop and poop behavior, it breaks morale, it breaks productivity, especially when you're trying to protect these teams that are supposed to be so focused and intentional on their work. So here are some of the lessons that we can learn. I'm gonna hand it over to, to Ross Libby now to provide some real life examples of a modern day Trojan horse of this sort of marketing transformation in action. Ross, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Colleen. Um, so, well, Colleen was offering up a, a lot of insights and findings from, as she said, our state of agile marketing uh, report and some of the industry view of things. I'm going to take the opportunity now to dig deeper into more of the use case study of it or a specific example of it. Um, before getting into that story, I want to bring back into focus quickly 
uh, the Trojan horse legend and an important figure in it. Um, so if we think back, what Colleen shared, right? Trojan horse, huge wooden horse used by the Greeks, turned the tide of the Trojan War. Um, but there was an individual named Odysseus uh, who sparked the idea to construct the wooden horse and hide that select group of um, individuals inside, right? Greeks sail away, Trojans think they won the war, cover of night, Greeks return, those in the horse come out, they open the gate, uh, and the entire Greek force enters in. So metaphorically, a Trojan horse has come to mean some sort of trick, stratagem, right? Um, to cause a target to invite a foe into a securely protected place. Um, so, you know, the story I'll tell, or if we think about the world of work now, it's not the same types of bright battles being fought between the Greeks and the Trojans. Um, you know, I, I don't think we want to think about, do we have to trick people, right? And all of that stuff. But I think very much this metaphor will continue with, and, and hopefully it'll continue to be insightful as we think about um, what it takes to, to create change and transformation. Because as I remember um, the story, there were challenges, conflicts, heroics, and that stratagem, maybe even, you know, you think of the Trojan horse to infiltrate traditional ways of working and approaches to transformation. Um, you know, in, in this world of work, as we're talking about, transformation is not uncommon. I'd be willing to bet that most companies throughout um, these last several years have needed some form of transformation to, to survive. Um, really transformation is becoming necessary in order to adapt, uh, to grow and to thrive. You know, I'd be willing to bet that, you know, many see transformation though as still, uh, they want it to be momentary. You know, there's this desire for this too shall pass um, and, and we'll weather it. I really think transformation more and more is, is something different. Um, and by definition, it's, it's talked about as a metaphoric. Um, and, you know, there, there's not necessarily a return back to the, the normal. You know, that's a risk of almost retreat, you know, and falling back. Um, but transformation requires that change. You know, if we look at it, it's through a dramatic change in former appearance. Um, you might even think maybe a, a giant wooden horse containing a surprise, you know, or uh, that cocoon, you know, uh, it contains the caterpillar and then it becomes the butterfly, right? Um, or could be a front runner, a pilot in organization, morphing mindsets and means of value delivery. I think any way you look at it, um, something like that, especially in business, it, it doesn't just happen by chance. And as Colleen was setting up, right, there's a, there's a plan um, and there's a catalyst, right? There's, there's something, there's a call to action for this change. Um, you know, I think plain and simple, you look at change though, and change is hard. It requires Herculean effort, right? Uh, especially the kind for transformation. Um, so as I'm Thinking back to the story now that several years back, it happened at a large multinational enterprise and it was the marketing organization there in the midst of transformation. Um, the reason they were transforming was evolving customer needs, competitive demands evolving, um, internal capabilities that had not kept up with the times. And so what the form of the transformation took on to begin was more structural. And so my experience has shown me structure is important, right? Structure is good, uh, but it's insufficient if you look for a more complete metamorphosis. Um, so, you know, if we look again at structure, right, it is sturdy. It provides the frame and the foundation, maybe like a wooden horse, um, but there's something inside that, that is needed to turn that tide of the war. Um, the metaphoric transformation, the organization does need structure, but it requires certain things internal to it. Um, and what I definitely have come to experience, or in the case of this story, there are certain tenets that go a bit deeper below the surface. And those are culture champions that blaze a trail, that bolster excitement around new ways of working, um, new ways of marketing, uh, operation optimizers that showcase the efficiencies, the benefits of getting to market sooner and sooner learnings. And then the impact side and the impact igniters demonstrate better business value achieved. Um, for the marketing organization here in this story we're focusing on, the good fight for this meaningful change, it was, it was struggle. 
and it had to go deeper and deeper beneath that structure because beneath that was legacy approaches and mindsets. Um, the consequence was the needle wasn't really moving here. It wasn't moving on the culture, or nor the operations, nor the impact. Um, you know, the, the structure alone wasn't sufficient. So let's look at more of what exactly did more of these starts look like? Um, for this organization, it was reorganization, uh, role redefinition. It was cascading across marketing organizations. And, and again, kind of that mindset of, right, the, the structural, kind of the outside aspects. Um, and they were looking to create some more centralization and specialization. Um, there was haste to move into this new operating model, right? There's, there was some excitement happening. Um, top level leaders were encouraging everyone, go be agile. Um, they tasked middle management to make it be so. Um, perhaps it was much like the Greeks, you know, ready to storm the shores, win the battle. This marketing organization had a seasoned crew. Um, they'd been there before. Sure, they could achieve victory once again with a valiant charge, but that was where the pitfall came in. Um, you know, I think our world is experiencing change at an accelerating rate. You know, despite how seasoned our company might be, any team or individual for that matter, I think you got to really look and say, you know, have we been there before? <laughs> Has this battle been fought before? What might be different about it now? Um, you know, transformation of today takes more than a valiant charge to come out victorious. It's a series of those strategic steps and campaigns. Um, you know, I was actually involved in this story at hand, and so I got a pretty good vantage point of this. Um, I saw an organization feeling the need to show how eager they were to charge into battle, declare victory. Uh, they weren't necessarily considering the longer war to be waged against traditional mindsets and ways of working. Um, they didn't necessarily have a good focus around those transformation tenants and the strategic positioning around the culture, the operations, and the impact. Um, you know, like any undertaking, especially if you're going in some foreign territories, best not to go alone, um, but better yet, how do you find some of those allies familiar with what it might take to transform um, and be able to heed the advice they have? Um, so that's more specific where I entered in the scene. Um, consider it maybe a battle-tested transformation coach. Maybe you could consider me Odysseus of sorts, um, but, you know, I think battle tested didn't mean that I have that undefeated track record or anyone you know in that position does. No, it, it means though there is learnings that had happened from both wins and losses, um, building capabilities for the long term, um, understanding that ultimate success is about the desired outcomes, not about you know making a mandate to go and, and be agile or tasking certain people to make sure it happens, but those outcomes around those transformation tenants, right? Culture, operations, impact. Um, so as I had the opportunity to assess the state of things, I definitely could applaud the spirit, the progress over perfection, right? The, the, the willingness to jump in, um, but I had to warn. We're pushing forward without shoring up the foundations. Uh, there was certain things around prioritization, empowerment um, of the people closest to the action right on the front lines of the work and cross-functionality very importantly. Um, a, a dynamic lacking was that as I mentioned middle managers were tasked to make this happen and they were working in some kind of pseudo strategic agile way. Um, again not a bad thing progress over perfection but we needed to go deeper once again. So like Odysseus I had a few ideas to turn the tides of this transformation um, and I definitely wanted to be part of the action. So what I started to work through and, and what I knew is that Agile uh, was not appropriately being deployed. Um, and we couldn't think of the prototypical packaging of what Agile is. Um, things around, you know, 100% dedication around a textbook scrum or Kanban type of deployment. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be received in the appropriate ways. Colleen called out and, you know, a study showing Agile marketing does not look the same as it might be in other places or specifically in software development. Um, so what I used is some of my own experiences and some of my own domain expertise, um, but needing to craft something a little more creative, uh, maybe cunning. Maybe it was a Trojan horse. 
which would allow us to sneak past some of those traditional mindsets um, and ways of working undetected. What I proposed was an initiative um, focused on a quarter time frame, so 90 days, and specific business outcomes we go after. Um, so the setup there is that transformation tend of impact and a focus on the outcomes. To drive it forward, I would be the coach for the initiative, um, and I wanted to make sure we had the right cross-functional team. It was eight plus one fearless leader to be dedicated at a 50% capacity. Um, and so here we're setting up those tenants around operations and culture um, and trying to avoid some of those pitfalls Colleen um, advised against and actually set up this team for success. If you just looked at the appearance alone, it seemed like a you know good way to deliver value. And not many people could argue with that. Um, so we did receive appropriate leadership buy-in um, to set forth. But what was very important is that we were allowed then those inner workings of the autonomy, the mastery, the purpose through the team that could build, that could swarm, that could upskill. And so what was being allowed for is us to get battle ready. So it did not mean though, an easy forward path was laid out in front of us. Um, if you're familiar with what is called the Tuckman model specific to the formation of a team, there's forming, storming, norming, and then performing. Uh, and we definitely experienced those elements. And I think it's something that any team organization should be aware of when you know starting down this path is there's going to be continued pitfalls and flexion points along the way. And we experienced those. We experience pitfalls of competing priorities, pressures to deliver, um, show business value at every turn along the way. Uh, we were definitely making progress in how we could be effective and efficient um, around some of those operational aspects. Uh, and it allowed us to kind of provide some early on wins. And so it was important to balance those dynamics. Were the impacts there yet, which is important? Not quite. But were we seeing elements of culture operations? Yes. Um, and the learning, the learning we could make a focus. You know, from the start, we had identified um, the outcomes and it was good. We did identify outcomes in a, in a right way. However, we didn't scope them as well as we could have. Um, and specifically, what could really be accomplished by a team of nine in that 90 day time frame? Um, so what we were to that point doing was trying to tackle every challenge across multiple customer segments and solutions. Um, it's probably just about as easy as right trying to fight a war on every front. You get spread thin, your energy fades. Um, for us, I'll be honest, it was a challenging point. And the question was, were we defeated? Or was this a pivotal point to pivot and persevere? And so, that's the question we asked ourselves. What should we do? How do we pivot? How do we persevere? We were feeling benefits of what working differently was like. There was excitement about forging new ways of marketing, um, the, that transformation tent again, culture. You know, we, we'd put on an armor that made us feel strong and capable. Uh, going back did not feel palatable at this point. And so I, we did what I believe the Greeks, I'm sure, did a time or two right during that Trojan War, specifically when they came up with the Trojan horse stratagem. Pivoted, persevered. The pivot, we refined that focus. We set out specific outcomes on a key customer segment, not all customer segments, and on a particular product offering, not all product offerings. And so we could continue forward on this good fight of ours. It actually helped us renew the focus, the energy. Uh, we readied ourselves to really deploy this Trojan horse of agility in a meaningful way. And so let me tell you what the deployment of our own Agile Trojan horse in action looked like. Um, the particular customer segment in focus that we identified was one that was a bit more difficult to get the attention of um, because it fell in the public sector, um, governmental space specifically, came with some more regulations than some of the other areas. So it's going to require a different way of thinking to unlock that opportunity for conversation, for connection. Um, the typical sales tactics one might use for other customer segments couldn't happen there because quite frankly, some of them would be considered illegal. 
Um, but nevertheless, what we needed was the same thing. We needed to make them aware of this great product offering, which had tremendous benefit for them. So we began ideating. How might we achieve that and meet that same need? Uh, possibilities mindset is an amazing thing. It engages, um, from my experience, all those transformation tenants, your culture and the team aspect of it, the operations, what ideas come from it and what they can offer and how they actually spark the thing to deploy. Um, and then the resulting impact that starts to come. Um, what brought for us was the light bulb moment. I'm actually from the least expected person. An individual, when we started this initiative, sat back, it was more of the quieter type, probably on the periphery, trying to understand what this could mean or look like. Um, but through this experience and what I truly appreciate is an agile way of working brings out the best in people. And it brings out the true team dynamic that allows us to build off each other. And this individual had the idea. And said, so what about a charitable contribution on behalf in exchange for a product demo? Um, that was that spark of creativity and the power of the team was unleashed from it. Uh, the, the challenge though, as this comes to face, was timing. So this was a great idea and we found ourselves at the end of July um, and we're trying to figure out, well, what kind of charitable contribution would have meaning, maximize impact, um, and came up quickly with a back to school partnership, um, specifically with a nonprofit that would provide school supplies for children in need. And so, yes, the excitement and energy grew, but also the complexities of a campaign and the timing around it. Traditional ways of working would have made this impossible, right? Um, it would take a minimum two months plus. And finding ourselves at the end of July, that takes you well into the beginning of that school time frame. But we were lucky, right? We were building and mounting the Trojan horse. New ways of marketing allowed us to break down the work, get aligned with the appropriate partners. Uh, put together a MVP, that minimum viable product, or MVC, minimum viable campaign, in an unprecedented fashion. And what was born was something called the Tools for Schools campaign. And with it, it brought the culture, the operations, and the impact. So let me share a little bit with you the results that came from this. Um, the team, at a minimum here, was tasked with pioneering new ways of working on how the organization could work and definitely we're showing the results of that. But very importantly is how they actually started to impact that in an organizational means. And so what was seen in how this campaign was brought to life was in the traditional approach, um, it would have taken eight plus weeks, probably more, multiple handoffs, many back and forth rounds of revisions. Um, what the team had, you know, come up with and their way of working while it being a win in and of itself was how it actually now provided better organizational momentum. Um, what they were able to do is create a speed to market move that allowed it to happen in 25% or quarter of the time. It was about two and a half weeks that the different tactics and elements and moving pieces came together, removing much of the non-value at a time. Um, Furthermore, it really started to hit on and drove the benefits around what was the greatest at need. And that was interacting, connecting with this customer. Marketing qualified leads came. Those turned into refined opportunities. And further down the road, the sales did come. And very importantly, broader impacts to the organization. The building of how this type of approach could scale out for other types of campaigns, for other types of teams. Um, and let me showcase a little bit on that front. They were that front runner, as I mentioned. This was an initiative um, that unsuspectingly, many people thought turned the tide of the transformation of the organization. Those culture champions, operation optimizers, impact igniters, it caught fire. Um, you, you see on this slide, the things I would say, transformation legends are built out of. Rapid iteration, ideation, Incremental learning that builds and builds into bigger and broader business value. Um, the team itself in this instance was recognized, um, given awards, you know, featured in company events. Um, but as importantly, they were a champion 
an evangelist for new ways of working that could start to be replicated in other aspects of the business model and change businesses as usual operations into lean, mean organizational teams. Um, I just highlight here the fact that it becomes so important for an organization to understand, okay, well, what is our entry point, right? What is our Trojan horse? How can we think about infiltrating maybe the business domains that are considered off limits or very important do not touch and start to evolve those mindsets and specifically the way in which culture can derive operations impact. Um, you know, much like the Greek epic, the new ways of working epic will continue to grow and it's continued to grow in that organization into the next component, the next powerhouse, the legend grows and grows. Um, but I don't want anyone to think, oh, this is just a myth, right? Like that Trojan horse, because there is an artifact that has survived to this day that I will show you. Um, it's a picture that reminds me of the, the battle scars, um, but more importantly, the victories, the learnings, the successes. Um, I can specifically now remember the people's faces that were the culture champions, the operation optimizers and the impact igniters. Um, and, and just in case people are like, well, you can Photoshop anything these days, I have the armor to prove it. Still with me to this day. Um, that's me in that picture. And yes, this is the, the shirt there. <laughs> But what I want to highlight is that, you know, business agility requires a strategy for entry. Um, and the experiences that we've had here is that marketing is a great Trojan horse for an organization, a great way in how it's positioned with its connections to IT and product, really the organization at large. Um, it's well suited to champion this cause for faster delivery to the customer, um, pave the way to these new ways of working, to these agile ways um, that have greater benefit for all. And so hopefully um, what Colleen and I have shared with you today has sparked inspiration, ideas, thoughts for how you can, whether it be at the individual team or organizational level, start to drive uh, a Trojan horse of your own to new ways of working. Um, with that, I wanna thank you definitely for the time and attention today. Um, if the topics have been inspiring or, or you do want to learn more, I'll give a few things that you can check out. One will be that fifth annual state of agile marketing. Um, I believe you'll get sent in a recap, a link to that, where you can actually download the report. Um, on that page, you could find the webinar that kicked off um, the delivering of that report. Um, you can read more of the data and analytics and insights behind it. Um, if the transformational piece is particularly of interest to you, I'd recommend uh, the book, Mastering Marketing Agility. Um, it's actually our co-founder and uh, CEO at Agile Service, Andrea Fryer, who is a many year marketer um, turned agilist um, that authored this book and really depicts how you think about or go about starting to evolve um, a marketing organization into these new ways of working. Um, and that book you can find online, many places, Amazon or Barnes and Nobles. Uh, and just lastly, um, on behalf of Colleen and I, very much thank you. Um, love if you would like to stay in touch. You can see our contact information here. So start first dot last names at agilesherpas.com. Find us on LinkedIn as well. Um, and welcome any questions we can now answer here. Yeah, Colleen, Ross, thanks so much. Uh, really great content. Colleen, great insight about the challenges that teams might experience and some of the most valuable and common practices they could try. A Ross, great success story. I love the points about needing to adjust culture, operations, and uh, for a successful adoption, really being deliberate about uh, the impact piece, sharing your wins to keep that momentum and, and buy-in going. Um, we have a lot of great questions that have already come in, so we're going to hop over to that. I'll, I'll share some of the questions that I've seen so far. Uh, and if you have questions, please go ahead and add them to the questions panel. So the first question I'm seeing is, I'm not familiar with a visual board. Is Litho workflow considered a visual board? So I can answer the second part if you want to explain more about the visual board. Sure, I can jump in here. So a visual board, it's pretty simple in concept. Um, you, it's, it can be online, it can be in person, it can be on a wall with a bunch of sticky notes. 
basically it's just a receptacle where you write down each individual task that either you or your team is working on that's it so it's getting that list that to-do list out of your mind and onto a piece of paper onto a screen somewhere where anyone that's in your team can be able to look at it and know where that project is at any step of the way yep and in terms of whether litho workflow is considered a visual board uh, we offer a, uh, a visual board that we call a Kanban view, uh, and that is essentially, it just means cards on a board that you can move and see. And so you can view your work in that view as a visual board, or you could also use dynamic Gantt charts or this view. So more than one way to see and manage your work. Uh, the next question that came in is, uh, in the examples you shared, did the working teams have other projects that they were working on concurrently? or were they just focused on this one project? Yeah, um, great question. And the answer is they had other work as well, as we found to be the reality for almost every you know team group we work with. Um, how it looked more specifically was the Agile initiative for what I described, I mean, that focus became really important and framing it to a specific you know customer segment and product. Um, but pretty much every individual, I think without exception, as I remember it, had other focuses and priorities. So they either had to service, you know, from their specific capability, whether it be, um, you know, demand generation or, you know, content writing or campaign planning, other aspects across multiple products or across multiple customer segments. Uh, I believe the reality is for most organizations, you, you for a while at least have this kind of in-between phase where you're trying to figure out um, how you've got kind of a, a traditional, more siloed, functional-based approach, which has people going and spending time on many different things and then starting to um, experiment at least with what could a more focused kind of value or customer-focused approach and a cross-functional team um, allow for. And then how we handled kind of foot in both worlds as it can be considered is um, the mornings were spent together as the cross-functional team um, focusing on that uh, specific focus. So it became that government customer segment eventually um, and the particular product. Um, and then afternoons allowed for people to um, spend time on the other priorities that they might have. Um, what I'll offer up though is that is something you hope to keep shorter lived if possible, especially as you see more and more value coming from the focus. And if you remember that visual Colleen shared around Kind of the gear diagrams how can you create more of those cross-functional teams and strategic focus areas around things like customer or product or strategic priorities so that your whole day can be spent on you know appropriate focus and driving the work and the outcomes that matter most forward that's a great approach to start to ease into it a little bit um, this next question is about more of a full transformation so what is the typical transformation timeline and what is involved Yes, um, Colleen, I'll welcome you to jump in too. Um, you know, I think what we find as far as a timeline, it depends. <laughs> um, I feel like that's a common answer in, in many things, but not to leave it there, you know, what we've seen and experienced is everything from more of the considered the big bang or flip the switch approach. So you're talking, um, you know, pretty immediate. Um, usually size of organization has an impl implication around that too. If you're maybe a smaller organization, more possible. Um, all the way up to, you know, this is being a, a multi-year journey. Um, and I'm not going to claim one is right or wrong. Um, if you looked at maybe a normal average, you're probably 12 to 18 months um, as far as if you're just wanting to look at maybe a timeline. And again, so many variables are how you frame the transformation. Is it across, you know, certain teams, across a whole organization? Um, whatever it might be. Um, if you look at typical steps along the way, um, again, it, it can vary, but what we found to be pretty common in how we've helped organizations and their transformations is it um, being a level of some discovery. Um, and with that, it's um, interviews or making sure you get lots of good feedback, um, some maybe surveys and, and aspects like that, understanding current state organizational diagrams and blueprints or design um, strategic priorities and, and elements like that. So you understand some of those good inputs in a, in a targeted and hopefully a, a couple month time frame that then leads to um, a piloting or that front runner, um, which you continue to evolve or take those learnings based on discovery and now making it more tangible to then a scale up approach 
So how can we take this and start to not just maybe one team, but that idea of teams of teams or more teams working together um, and building it more collectively throughout the breadth of whatever part of the organization is being focused on. Um, and then the important step of self-sustain. Um, so just with self-sustain being, how are you building in the capabilities, the resiliency, so that whether new people join, whether new challenges come your way, you have some of that almost like 70, 20, 10 training in place. So some formal, uh, maybe in your own learning management systems, the organic aspects, communities of practice or tapping into the industry in the right ways could be a thing like this webinar, you know, staying in tune to some of that. And then the 70% of just on the job, right? So I'm continuing to build and um, create capabilities and cross training and things like that just in my day-to-day -day work. Um, so just to have that again, discovery, uh, pilot, scale, self-sustain is the steps. Great. One thing I will add to that, Ross, as well, and I know that you threw out that number of 12 to 18 months, and so that doesn't mean that you're not going to see any change or any benefits until that 18-month mark, right? Your teams are going to be constantly learning. You're going to be doing some trial and error here. So it's very common that teams can see some progress or really start to get the hang of what's expected of them and maybe how to structure these things after they've been working in teams for like 90 days to six months, right? That's that's a huge learning block there. So there will be progress along the way, even though you can't consider transformation complete at that time. Okay. And I think we have time for this last one here, which is how do you know what kind of project would be a good fit to pilot agile marketing? Do you want me to, I'll start on this one, Ross. Um, so when you're thinking of types of work for an Agile team, you want to make sure that it's something that is important, that has some high value there. And I know that that's contrary to popular belief for a lot of people because they're piloting Agile, they don't want to mess this up, right? But that's actually the reason why you want to choose something that is important, because that means that you're not going to allow yourself to mess it up. You're going to put the time and the investment in to making sure that you have that focus. Um, you also want to make sure that it's something fairly large in size. And when we're thinking about pilot teams, we I mentioned that 90 days, something that that teams can really do a couple iterations on. They can go through a couple weeks of work, reflect black, back and say what worked well, what didn't, what do we want to change? Implement that change, pilot that, and then do more and more learnings there. Ross, what do you want to add to this? No, you pretty much, you know, I think nailed it. It's just looking at the sweet spot between, um, yeah, how do you get enough importance behind it, um, the right amount of um, risk per se behind it, mm -hmm. um, the right amount of leader support, um, you know, consider it spectrums and you don't probably want all of them on one end or the other, right? You don't want all the risk in the world, but if there's no risk, is anyone going to care, right? Is it going to actually allow you to do something meaningful as an organization that you can, you know, I'll go back to, you know, showcase the culture and the operations of the impact and get people's attention so that this can actually spark something more as you scale and as you self-sustain. Sure. <clears throat> Important enough to get that real support long enough to learn something from it, right? And bring it to the next. Right. Wonderful. Um, all right. Well, thanks so much, Colleen and Ross. We are at time here. Really appreciate you joining us. And for everyone else, head on over to Agile Sherpas to the website to download that report. I will also send out an email with a link to today's recording. And again, Ross, Colleen, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And we will see you another time. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you.